Number 10, asbestos fabrics. Chris will like this, he'll remember these. Picture this, it's 2004. It's Saturday afternoon and your dad just got finished watching an episode of Trucks. Nice. And now you have control over the TV remote. Saturday morning cartoons, here we come. I used to love the Kirby show, he's one of my favorites. I love that guy. But just before you change the channel, there's a commercial with an old man who looks very concerned. And he says, have you been affected by mesothelioma and or because of exposure to asbestos? Then you may be qualified for compensation. I believe it went something like that. Maybe I should call Saul Goodman. Where's he when you need him? All jokes aside, those commercials were not joking. They weren't joking around at all because it's been known asbestos was very harmful for a long time. So yeah, it was pretty bad. Victorian times were no different. Mostly using things to protect from heat or fire. And while it did do the job somewhat, it was very harmful for the lungs. And like the old man says in the commercial, it could be cancerous. Hence, mesotheliomia. I, can't, I said it right there. I said it the first time when I was impress impersonating him, and now I can't say it. Mesothelioma. There it is. Mesothelioma. Number nine, Shields Arsenic Green. For some reason, green was all the rage back in Victorian times. I'm not sure why. I'm personally not a fan of green, but except for the green screen. We love that. I know you guys can't see that, but I love, I love the green screen. When I was a paint mixer, sometimes people would bring up the wildest colors for me to mix, and they weren't for art projects. They were for walls so weird, but I digress. There was a common color back then called Shields Green. It was made in a lab by a spooky, scary Swedish guy named Shiel. Huh, go figure. This color was used in everything, dresses, fabric, paint, you name it. The trouble is, it was a compound of copper and arsenic. Therefore, it was toxic and caused a lot of harm. It also had links to cancer. For example, when Napoleon was banished to St. Helena, the walls of the house he was staying in were painted with shades of shield. Eee, that's not good. Pretty sure he died of stomach cancer too, so there's a connection there. Number eight, beetle dresses. Like I said, the green color was really in at the time, and there were other ways of achieving such a gorgeous glow besides using shield paint. Similar to how Cleopatra made her eyeliner, some dresses in Victorian times were made with pieces of beetle. Oof. I'm sure there are some folks out there who probably don't mind that, but for the rest of us that don't care for Halloween or My Chemical Romance and Tales from the Crypt Keeper, hard pass. Basically, any beetle or colorful bug that wings or I guess caprices was worth keeping was prepared and sewn into fabric. The finished product doesn't look like it came from creepy crawlies. It actually looks kind of good, to be honest. Mind you, this is a time when a lot of things were still done by hand, so there's a little bit of love in each beetle you stitch. That's kind of nice. Mom, mom helped out with that one. That was nice. Number seven, wearing black for weeks. Losing a family member is tough. Life can get hard. In Victorian times, passing away was a big deal. There was usually a big funeral, flowers, tears, everything. The whole works. The crazy part is, you were expected to wear black or mourning clothes, as they were called, thought to be an outward expression of one's emotions and feelings. However, it's not like that one funeral of the distant uncle you had, where as soon as you got home, you ripped off your suit and hopped on Call of Duty to see what your friends are doing. Oh, on the contrary, my ninja diffusing friends, because in Victorian times, your search and destroy matches would require you to wear those black mourning clothes for a long time, sometimes even weeks and months on end. Queen Victoria wore hers for years after her husband and pass, and it was odd to see her in anything but black. That's a weird story. That's crazy. Number six, Annaline Dye. In 1856, William Henry Perkin was trying to create an anti-malaria drug using aniline. After all, the British were spending an awful lot of time in foreign nations doing as the British do and needed a cure to keep doing what they do. Well, he did not find a cure for malaria, but he did discover it makes a very lovely dye that makes deep reds, purples, and black. You need that for the funerals. Naturally, this picked up a lot of steam and began to be used in everything from socks to shoe polish. Yeah, I know, right? Trouble is, once people got enough exposure to the clothing with aniline dyed, their skin would go red, itchy, inflamed, and was known for causing really bad headaches. That's because it would absorb their skin and poison their blood. That sounds pretty <laughs> actually, I don't, I don't want that. Number five, zinc chlorine coats. This one's bad, man, but it was stopped before it became a trend, thank God. Picture this, it's Victorian London and you're but a humble city servant. Your job is to clean the streets. One night it begins to rain, as it is known to do in England. I hear it rains there a lot, I don't know. And the city provides these humble men with coats that have a zinc chloride layer. 
in the fabric. It was supposed to protect against rain and, and wetness and whatnot. A lot of chemistry in this video, but some might already guess that this was a bad idea. Zinc chloride is not only corrosive, but water soluble. So after a shift in the rain, a lot of these men came back with really nasty chemical burns. And no, they didn't have emergency showers like in Heisenberg's RV. They didn't have that or your high school chemistry class. It was really bad. They stopped it immediately because that's really bad. Number four, the cholera belt. This is just so silly to me. While the Victorian era seems like a long, long time ago, it's really only like three to four people ago. So yeah, your, your grandparents or maybe even your great grandparents could have experienced a life like this. As we all know, disease was rampant back then and thank God we're a little less gross now, am I right? Well, cholera was quite the tummy bug going around back then, causing upset stomach, indigestion, and the Oregon Trail's favorite, diarrhea. Ooh, no thanks. So the people of Victorian times came up with something that, well, wasn't only functional, but fashionable too. Very nice. The cholera belt was a piece of red fabric that was to be wrapped around the belly to keep you warm. That's because people thought having a cold belly caused cholera. Because yeah, that's, that's, that definitely gives you cholera. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's what it does. It's not. It's a, it's a sickness. It's a virus. Number three, radium makeup. Okay, sure. I'll give you that radiation and radioactive materials were pretty much being discovered and barely understood for the time. Okay, sure. It was new. Look at Madame Curie. Tragic story there. So when the very interesting radium was discovered, it got thrown into everything because, yeah, why not? Radium makeup, radium watches, you name it, radium was in it. While at first exposure to radium, you'd be fine, not too much to worry about. However, after years of direct physical contact on the skin, yikes, there's going to be a problem. It's radioactive. It's the reason why you shouldn't get too many x-rays. Not that it's radium, I'm just saying radiation in general is not good for you. Not much to explain in this one except it was used and manufactured in women's makeup and they used it and I, I'm sorry, that's just, that's just rough. Number two, mercury hats. Mercury was nothing new in the medical field in Victorian times. It had been used in ancient China for a long time before that. And yes, it was poisonous. It was harmful to you. However, in Victorian times, some hats included mercury in their production process. Now, why is that so bad? Well, because mercury makes you go insane. Hence why they called it Mad Hatter's Disease. I could not think of a worse name for a disease. Now, not that it's a fashion point, but this was also readily used for treating syphilis at the time. So something that's readily available for the public and health would wind up in closed production. It makes sense. If there's a lot of it, sure, it makes a lot of sense. But it makes people go crazy. That's, sorry, who's talking to me, what? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Bad <laughs> joke, funny. Number one, cellulose nitrate. This one's crazy. As you can tell on this list, there's been a lot of clothes and fabrics mixed with some naughty chemicals. Naughty. Of course, this is years before OSHA or Wemyss, so yeah, it probably wouldn't happen today. However, this one takes the cake. When cotton or a cotton-like product is introduced to nitric acid, it forms cellulose nitrate, which is also known as flash cotton. Not because it takes its shirt off at an edgy concert, but because I cannot stress this enough how unstable and flammable it really is. Even the slightest heat source could set it off. There's even stories of people spontaneously combusting after being exposed to items made with such. The lights in the studio, they probably set it off. That's how, that's how sensitive it is. That's pretty crazy. <sighs> More sensitive than your first day to prom, you know what I'm saying? At number 10, death photography. Has anyone out there looked at really old photos and had that eerie thought that everyone in that photo is dead now? I have. I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's just something that comes to mind sometimes. Back in the Victorian era though, they really had that thought because death photography became a trend at the time. Back then, people were dropping like flies. They dealt with a lot of illnesses like measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, rubella, typhus, and cholera. Death was all around them, but with the rise of photography, this became a new way of keeping a memento of their loved one who passed away. Before this, they would keep locks of hair and other items from their loved ones, but once they got access to cameras, families started posing with their dead relatives. Literally. Families would often keep the bodies of their dead loved one in the house for days after their passing in order to have that mourning period, but soon they started staging photo shoots with the remains of their relatives, posing them and dressing them up to make it look like they're still alive. Family members would take pictures with the deceased to have one last family portrait before burying their loved one. It's kind of heartwarming in a way, but also really creepy. 
At number nine, emigration. During the Victorian era, there was unfortunately a lot of orphan children living in the streets of London. It became a pretty big problem because of the sheer amount of young people without homes or families. It was estimated that around 30,000 children were living on the streets in London in 1869. Soon a program was put into place to try and solve this issue and people started rounding up these orphan kids and shipping them off elsewhere to work in some of the British colonies. Many of the kids who were shipped off ended up working as farmhands or as domestic servants. Though many children were shipped off to places like New Zealand and Australia, the majority of them went to Canada. About 80,000 of them actually. They were sent away with hopes that they would be able to live better lives, but unfortunately for many of those kids, they didn't end up having any better luck in compared to when they lived on the streets. This practice ended up becoming pretty controversial as you can imagine. Before we carry on talking about the strange things that happened in the Victorian era, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mental Health Back in the Victorian era, the study of the human brain and psyche was still relatively new, so no one really knew what was going on up in people's noggins. Mental asylums started to pop up and people started getting diagnosed with mental problems even if the diagnosis wasn't accurate. The three labels that a patient could fall under were the manic, the melancholic, and those with dementia. The symptoms for those big three labels often varied, and people were admitted to asylums for some pretty messed up reasons. There was a list of common causes for mental illness that people referred to back then, and it included things like, quote, laziness, novel reading, superstition, an immoral life, and intemperance, as well as the act of self-pleasuring. For women, they could also be sent to asylums for some pretty ridiculous reasons, like imaginary female trouble, hysteria, rumor of husband murder, and even fits of desertion of husband. I am so glad things have changed since then. At number 7, Grave Robber When you think of jobs back in the Victorian era, you might think of things like chimney sweeps and lawyers. But another relatively popular, though questionable, profession was being a grave robber. Yes, people actually made a living off robbing graves. As people studied medicine, they needed cadavers to practice on, but there was a law saying that only the bodies of those who had been executed for a crime could be used as a cadaver, and since the laws changed to include less and less crimes having death penalties, soon people started running out of cadavers to practice on, and this gave way to the boom in the grave robbing industry. People can make a pretty penny for snatching bodies from cemeteries and selling them to medical professionals and students. Fresher bodies went for more money, and the grave robbers not only made money off the sale of the cadaver, but they also charged a fee, so they ended up with a little extra cash in their pockets. Eventually, the grave robbing business became such a big problem that cemeteries started installing watchtowers and guards to prevent people from getting away with the dead. At number 6, Beauty I've talked about this before in some past videos, but the Victorian era was famous for its strange beauty practices, so I just had to include it on this list. You're probably familiar with the makeup from the Victorian era. Women often painted their faces white to look as pale as possible, but even though they believed it made them look beautiful, it also did a lot of harm to their health. The white face paint that women would use was lead based, and as we all by now, lead makes you dead. But this white lead paint isn't the only thing that harms people's skin. Women would also wash their faces with ammonia to make their skin look paler. At night, women would rub opium on their faces, and if they were really dedicated to their beauty regime, they would also ingest arsenic. They were literally poisoning themselves in the name of beauty. Women would also use mercury on their eyebrows and eyelashes, and would use lemon juice or belladonna in their eyes, which could cause blindness in some people. Once again, I'm glad things have changed. At number 5, no divorce. Nowadays, divorce is quite common. All you have to do is sign a paper and you're done. But back in the Victorian era, before the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857 allowed divorce, people had to find different ways of getting rid of their spouses. After all, just because there was no divorce doesn't mean that everyone was happy in their marriages. It turns out that in order to solve their problems and get rid of their spouse, people would just sell their wives, either in public or in private sales. Most of the time, a man would take his wife to the town square and just sell her off to a new man. According to some records, some women had the power to veto a sale, and sometimes it was for cash. Though I think the cheapest that a wife was ever sold for was a pint of beer. This wasn't necessarily bad for the woman, because if she was sold to someone else, things could sometimes work out and she could live a better life with a better spouse. And if she didn't, then she would just get sold again and get to try her luck with a new man. At number 4, food additives. These days, people are becoming more and more concerned with artificial additives in their food. All natural, organic, pesticide, and hormone-free food 
food is becoming more and more popular, but back in the Victorian era, people were putting all kinds of additives in their noms, and a lot of it was really, really bad for you. Like, we're talking deadly. Chalk and alum were often added to bread dough to make it whiter, and sometimes pipe clay, plaster repairs, or sawdust was added to the mix as well. Red lead was sometimes added to cheese, lead was added to cider, mustard, wine, sugars, and candies. Copper sulfates were used in preserving fruits, jams, and wine. Mercury was used in candies, and even ice cream was made using a water and chalk mixture. All of these unsafe ingredients are actually what prompted the food safety industry because no matter what's going on, you shouldn't be eating lead, chalk, and mercury. At number three, corpse medicine. Now earlier I mentioned the whole grave robber industry and how that really took off during the Victorian era, but now let's talk about how they used corpses in their medicine. Back then, some people believed that consuming certain parts of the human body could cure their ailments. I know. Gross, right? One of the more popular medicines back then was a mixture made with human skull and chocolate, and it was believed to cure apoplexy. Back in the Victorian era, medical texts were published describing what parts of the human body could be used to treat specific ailments. One text described mixing the skull of a young woman with treacle to treat epilepsy. Another text says that you could treat paralysis with a candle made of human fat. Apparently, executioners were linked to this type of medicine as they would, you know, execute someone and then use the remains to become a doctor and treat people's illnesses. Imagine Grey's Anatomy, but with Victorian medicine. Sounds like an interesting thing to watch, but also probably not to experience. At number two, mummies. Speaking of dead people though, people from the Victorian era were oddly fascinated with mummies. I mean, I can understand the fascination to a certain extent because they're old and cool, but of course, these people just had to be extra weird and take that obsession with mummies to heights that they didn't need to be. People used ground up mummies to make paint, Pieces of mummies were sold in jars, and they were even used in advertising. One candy shop put a mummy on display in the store, claiming that it was the daughter of a pharaoh who saved baby Moses. I mean, that's weird, right? I understand that this was all happening as archaeologists were starting to uncover lost treasures and secrets from Egypt, but I mean, a mummy in a candy shop? Seems a little much. And finally at number one, baby farmers. Now for what I believe is probably the most disturbing thing from the Victorian era, baby farmers. Basically, this was an industry of women who would take unwanted babies and either take care of them, give them to new parents, or unfortunately have them disposed of. One famous case of the darker side of baby farmers comes from a woman named Amelia Dyer. She was known to have charged women a lot of money to take their babies off their hands, but unfortunately the children wouldn't survive Amelia's care. It is believed that Amelia was responsible for the passings of hundreds of babies, making her one of the biggest monsters of the Victorian era. Number 10. It's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era. And who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more. We need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time. Because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen, where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. 
Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number 7. Diet Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number 9 and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely. And Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend, oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night. Number 5. Jolly Lad When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally, it flourished. Especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so. Uh... Number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial unaliver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now, we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victorian London or maybe some B-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias. Some say it was Prince Albert. There's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least, and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. 
Anyway, be careful out there, ladies. Just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blighty herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband. Who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic. That's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that one next time, Bly. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror, the absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? I, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10, act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Oh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies Gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd boop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare a woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind? Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number nine, no calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver-tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7-Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft. Call on a man? No way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm a little lonely. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was. Especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone, because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby, yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked, as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together, but given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went, and they ignored it. It's like they live together, and you start putting the pieces together, and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group. 
Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five. Big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me. And it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no. Commonly called self-pollution. Which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his carrot or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just, as long as the bedroom door's closed, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything. And if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it. Cause with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did, and I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad, so a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes! by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. 
I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching, so sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled, reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms. But that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Because science. Number 10, train engine cleaner. Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect! You can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Number nine, linker boy or linker men. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you. Oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Oi, where you going mate? You forgot to like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not take a little peek over at our Facebook, where you'll find behind the scenes content. Get on with it! All right, all right, bloody hell, bloody hell. Number eight, knock her up. No, not like that. God, look. I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker-upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality, and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time, if only it was real. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five, 
a rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, there is a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though, it's gonna be me. Number four, an upright worker. Upright workers, otherwise known as chimney sweeps, actually started off being children as young as the age of four. The smaller size of the little kiddos was perfect for fitting inside and climbing up and down chimneys. The little suckers would rub their elbows and knees up against the brick of the chimney so much that they would be scraped raw before callousing. Isn't that lovely? No. No, it's not. It's horrible. Some children were deliberately underfed to keep them small enough to do the job. Some of them would get permanent lung damage from the dust and smut and smoke from the chimney. Some kids even got stuck in the chimneys. Thank the Lord they eventually passed a law that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be a chimney sweep. But even then, tis not a profession many would like to have. Number three, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls and in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. Oh, you wanna take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right, these girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two. Resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition, other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god-awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number one, night soil man. All right, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop, night soil is poop. And the night soil man, well, you see, before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soilman come in. Yes, his job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. Number 10 is chloroform the hiccups away. Nowadays we know a nasty case of hiccups is curable by just holding your breath or chugging a bunch of water. But if this was 1899, you'd be prescribed chloroform. Known by many as the mysterious liquid on the rag placed over the, someone's face to make them faint in many period pieces or cartoons, chloroform gained popularity after Queen Victoria demanded its usage during her labor in 1853, after having been denied it in her previous labors. By taking these lengths to reduce the annoyance of hiccups, your vital organs may pay a Deep price. Chloroform has the potential to damage the nervous system, lungs, and trachea, as well as the liver and kidney when exposed long term. This is just one of many medical remedies that we'll be covering from the first Merrick Manual of Diagnosis and Therapy, the oldest continuously published English language medical textbook. All the quack treatments in our list today used to be found in this mass encyclopedia. For instance, number nine in our countdown is smoke inhalation for asthma and other lung conditions. This may be one of the more counterintuitive remedies on our list, as it's easy to see now that smoke is not beneficial for asthma at all. Through the late 19th and into the next, however, inhaling smoke or 
smoke as well as stramonium, a hallucination inducing nightshade, as well as lobelia, known for its sedative properties, were popular treatments for asthmatics. Asthma is caused when your airways can narrow or swell while producing excess mucus. Smoking meanwhile has been shown to eventually reduce the number of cilia, the lungs filaments which help transport mucus into the lungs, which only leads to the worsening of asthma symptoms. This wasn't the only weird tobacco smoke belief however, in 1872 an English newspaper talked of tobacco smoke enemas, which even reported that hundreds of lives might have been spared by the tobacco smoke enema. Okay. Weird enough. Plasters, no not the British word for band-aids, is number 8. This medical treatment was said to have sucked the badness out of a person. They were like a nicotine patch, made up of a thin layer sheet of wax as well as leather, and it was able to stick onto the skin. In the wax there were remedies such as lead, opium, frankincense, tobacco, etc. This mix would be applied while still warm to ensure the adhesion of the plaster. Plasters were sold to anyone of any age and came in many different shapes and sizes so that they may be applied to different areas. Areas. What were they used for? Everything. Cough, cold, period pain, organ failure, alcoholism, headache, the list can go on forever. Seeing as they wanted the patch to pull as much badness from the body as possible, these patches could be left on for two days, to two weeks, to forever. Without washing of course. Naturally these patches trapped in a lot of moisture that could cause infections, blisters, rashes and hives underneath, especially once the patch is removed and the skin is finally exposed to air. Arsenic, like plasters, was a cure all and it's number 7 in the countdown. If you've seen our other video, Top 10 Unusual Fashion Trends from the Victorian Era, you might know that arsenic was in everything in the Victorian era. Makeup, wallpaper, dye. No exception was made in medicine either as arsenic was prescribed for anything from anemia in Merrick's diagnosis manual to anthrax, cancer, reduced libido, syphilis, or even cholera. While it was most popular to consume arsenic, it could also be inhaled or injected. Being a byproduct of smelting, it's no wonder arsenic was everywhere during the industrial revolution as there was an excess of it. So it was incredibly accessible and a household remedy. Since doctors already prescribed it to do so much, everyday people just start to use it to treat any common ailment. Unsurprisingly, many people suffered arsenic poisoning symptoms. The ailments are now referred to as Fowler's disease. Number 6 is all kinds of gross and questionable. The everlasting pill. When the Merck manual was first published, part of the comprehensive treatment plan for an eruptive fever, which is a classification for diseases like scarlet fever, smallpox and chickenpox, was actually laxatives. Castor oil was the main laxative choice for Victorians up until the debut of the everlasting pill, made up of a metal now known to be toxic called antimony, would be invented. Swallowing this would induce severe vomiting and diarrhea, thus giving the body what they thought to be a healthy cleanse, and their intention was to purge diseases from the body. It earned the name the everlasting pill, as the pill would pass through the gastric system mostly intact, meaning it could be retrieved and cleaned for future use. Seeing as the metal was greatly valuable at the time, it was quite common to keep it in the family and hand it down generation to generation. Imagine getting that in your granny's will. Watch out, it may shock ya. Number 5 is shock treatment. When profit can be made off of insecurity, unsavory business flourishes. Victorians honed in on the man's moral weaknesses as a cause for erectile dysfunction, and impotence was thought to be caused by either too much sex and masturbation or not enough. So doctors took a few shocking routes, literally, such as galvantic baths or bathtubs filled with electrodes, which were supposed to restore sexual desire in an advertised six sessions. For a more direct approach, a thin rod with running electric current could be placed up into a man's ear. Repeat that twice a week, about five minutes each time, and your little man should be ready to rumble. By the late 1800s, ads were running for electric belts aimed at weak men. They claimed to help cure kidney pain and sciatic nerve issues and back aches and headaches and nervous exhaustion, and of course, mainly their dysfunction. While today impotence is recognized as the result of physical or mental duress, age, or genetics, the belief that electric shock therapy is a useful cure for impotence still persists, and some studies have shown positive signs. See that, fellas? Don't knock it till you try it. Speaking of electrocuting genitals, you can't tell me that didn't happen at least once with the first electric vibrators, which is number 4 in our countdown. Female hysteria became a diagnosable medical condition way back in medieval times when the concept of a wandering uterus, when a discontented or displaced uterus would cause a woman ill health, was first coined. Believed to have symptoms such as irritability, insomnia, fainting, anxiety, menstruation, or horniness, pretty much every woman showed these symptoms. Hysteria was 
pretty common. Doctors cure hysterical paroxysm, an orgasm. For hundreds of years leading up to this invention, doctors were manually administering pelvic massages to women to achieve the necessary cure. But all that wrist work added up over time and doctors needed a break. So cue Dr. Joseph Mortimer Granville, he created an electric steam powered electromechanical medical instrument, nicknamed the manipulator. The device allowed women to give themselves home massages to cure their wandering wounds and giving doctors the well deserved break they needed. A questionable cure for a very questionable diagnosis. Number three is not for the faint of heart. They loved leeches. It may be crazy to imagine, but between the late 1700s and well into the early 1900s, there was a booming leech trade all across Europe. Leeches were shipped from Germany to America by the tens of thousands. England even had to start importing them from France by the mid 1800s as their own leech stocks were not even enough to supply their own doctors. Francis Bressoyas believed that all diseases resulted from the excess buildup of blood and documented this belief in a medical journal that would subsequently cause leeches to become the go to treatment in France and then later spread across Europe. This usage of leeches then became worldwide from there and so obscene that the creatures started to go extinct. However, what these quacks didn't know is that bloodletting was very 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 rarely beneficial to any conditions and applying leeches often resulted in detrimental side effects such as blood loss, diarrhea and vomiting or those with poor immune systems could even be exposed to hazardous bacteria and infection. Let alone death from hemorrhagic shock for literally anyone they did this to. Eventually the excessive use of leeches meant that they became too expensive to ship, too scarce due to the over farming to find, and medically obsolete in the face of new science that questioned the medical merits of bloodletting. Thank god. Number 2 doesn't allow you to touch where number 1 usually comes out. It's the masturbatory mental illness. Obviously it's natural, normal and well fun, but the Victorian perspective of masturbation was nowhere near what it is today. As our old timely friends saw it as a serious threat to mental and physical health or even could kill you. Self love was seen as an ultimate evil, but beyond moralistic arguments many physicians thought that every orgasm drained a mans energy. Married men were warned by doctors to limit the amount of sex they were having, while unmarried men were encouraged and urged to conserve their essence by avoiding sex altogether, particularly masturbation. Even wet dreams and uncontrolled ejaculation were considered a sexual disorder function as masturbation essentially became the male version of hysteria. So how did you treat this condition? Men had to stop masturbating. Fear and shame campaigns did what they do best and stimulated the market to provide quick quack remedies. They came in the form of anti masturbation devices that looked like torture chambers. Most popular was the jugum, which was a metal ring attached around the base of a man's, you know, and then screwed on. If he was to become erect at any point, whether awake or asleep, the now inflated skin would make contact with sharp metal teeth that would dig in. Like I said, most popular. Consider how much worse these other options were for that to be the primo choice. A spermatic truss was essentially the first jock strap, but meant for every day. And the Bowden device fastened a little metal helmet to the end of a man's member that bound up into his pubic hair so that it would be ripped out should he become erect. I'm more than happy to keep going, but I'm sure more than enough people are wincing right now. Keep in mind, while these men were going through this to avoid masturbation, women were being prescribed it as a cure. Number one on our countdown may be a bit of a surprise, surgery. How could surgery be a questionable treatment? Well, it itself isn't, but the men performing it and their hygiene towards surgery were. Most famous is Robert Liston, said to be able to remove a leg in 30 seconds, he notoriously used his own mouth to hold scalpels, knives, and even once sucked the pus out of a woman's throat wound. According to medical historian Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, surgeons never washed their instruments or their hands, and Victorian surgeons were known for wearing old surgery garments out of prowess, reportedly so stiff with old blood that they were nearly cardboard in appearance. Even the operating tables themselves were rarely washed down, and it was said a visitor to St. George's Hospital in London 1825 discovered mushrooms and maggots thriving in the damp, dirty sheets of a patient's bed. When asked why they hadn't complained, the patient assumed this to be the norm. And what about surgery in the moment? Well, the patients were conscious and undrugged as they were operated on, and surgeries needed to be fast as a result. One in four people died 
made after their surgery, whether it was still on the operating table or from infections afterwards. But what about our buddy I mentioned, Dr. Liston? Only 1 in 10 of his patients died. This was because of his speed. Time me gentlemen, time me, he'd shout to the surgery spectators to put his legendary speed to the test. Sure, he did accidentally castrate somebody once because of his wild motions, but nobody's perfect. In fact, while he's remembered for being the first surgeon to use anesthesia, wash his knives, and invent a still used medical tool, he is the only surgeon to ever have a 300% death rate. I'd be remiss not to mention that during a leg amputation, his lightning speed reportedly cut off three fingers of the assistant who had been holding down the patient. Then, as he brought the knife back up, he slashed the coat of a spectator. The spectator reportedly died immediately of fright, likely a heart attack. Though the assistant and patient survived initially, like most who were treated in Victorian hospitals, they died not long after from infection, which was also just called hospitalism at the time because of how many people died that way. It's easy to say that going to a Victorian surgery or a hospital may have been as efficient as rubbing dirt into a wound. Number 10. The Dirty Tames. When you think of Victorian England and the people, there's only really two classes, the wealthy and the ones who are broke and sound like they're from Peaky Blinders love, yeah, that's right. However, even for women of high esteem with their bottomless undies and lady mains growing a flush, the streets of Victorian London weren't very bourgeois to say the least. Muddy dirt roads, thieves, beggars, and a really bad smell, it just didn't smell very nice. Oh, and also a really scary guy, but we'll get to that in part one. But perhaps the most disgusting was the Thames River, which after years of treating it the same way Brendan Fraser was treated after the Mummy franchise was over, it wasn't a good look. It was full of filth, sewage, garbage, and animal cadavers, so much so that it was said you could walk across the river on top of them. That is no place for a lady to be. Oof. Number nine, calf ear appetizers. This one goes out to all the folks who like their steak well done, as this may be too much to stomach. Given the way food was prepped and handled back then, I would agree with most folks that cooking the devil out of your meat was probably just the safer bet. Sucks for me because I like my steak rare, as rare as you can make it. Blue, almost honestly, I, I love it like that. I am also willing to bet that most of you folks who like your steak well done aren't a big fan of fat and gristle. <laughs> I also love fat and grizzle. I just like meat, what can I say? What I'm getting to is calf ear appetizers. Yes, cooked calf ears, which I'm pretty sure are just like pure cartilage. Higher class women could often find themselves at parties where they would serve up this chewy delight. You'd probably just be chewing on that for a while. I feel like most people wouldn't like that. Is Chris a cartilage guy? I don't know, we'll see. Number eight, bottomless undies. I think I speak for everyone when I say that putting on a clean, fresh pair of underwear is a nice feeling. Gone is the brown underwear that was once white of yesterday, replaced with fresh loving linen of today. Now, if you're also like me, then you probably have some underwear with holes in it. I'll throw them out eventually, I'll, I'll get around to it, just I'll wear them a few more times first and then I'll get rid of them. But did you know that some ladies underwear in the Victorian era had no bottoms? Yeah. Part of the many layers of clothing that women were wearing back then, their underwear had no bottoms, which to me is the whole point of wearing bloomers in the first place. You gotta keep your business warm and packed away, I just don't understand what the point of having it all hang out is, that's just, that's just stupid, I don't know. Number 7, no razors. There's a joke about the 70s, George W. Bush and garden hedges here, but I'm gonna let you fill in the blanks. Basically, this is a time in history where you cannot hop in the whip and drive on over to your local hair razor dealership because there ain't no whips and there ain't no CVS. Or Shoppers Drug Mart if you're Canadian. Today you can buy disposable razors pretty much anywhere and there's multiple models for doing so. When things get hairy, you got options. Women in the Victorian era were not so lucky. They had to go for the natural look. Now, not that there's anything wrong with that, it's just, I feel like a girl's gotta have her options. She gotta be able to, you know, do her own thing. Why not? Number six, hand cleavage. This goes for every inch of the skin, really, but women had to cover up back then. That means no ankles, neck, or God forbid a wrist. If a man saw a wrist, they would act, uh, ooh. Well, I don't know if they were that down bad, but women of higher esteem wore gloves. There's, there's etiquette to gloves. It was all part of the, the culture, which means only women with dosh could practice such glove etiquette. I say no woman should have the cover up. She should wear whatever the heck she wants when the heck she wants to. However, with the gloves, I believe there's a separate issue. I have an issue being a big dude with asthma. I sweat a lot more than the average folk. It just sucks, but if I was a fair lady with those gloves on, 
Well, I might want to leave them on. Wouldn't want to ruin anyone's appetites for kaffir appetizers because the smell and the sweat, it just, ooh, it'd be gross, ooh. Number five, dress is too big. This is something I'm glad isn't a thing anymore. I, I'm not a person who likes to dress up. I'm a simple dude. Casual and comfortable is my forte. However, uncomfortable wearing suits is. I like to think I clean up well. And I understand sometimes you gotta wear drip. It's just how life goes. Sometimes you gotta dress up. I just don't think people should be showing up to any formal events in cowboy boots and a popped collar shirt. I've known a few of those people. But what I'm really talking about here is the obtuse size of women's dresses and just the whole culture of women's fashion back then. It's just crazy. Large and overbearing dresses with enough material to use as blankets when you sleep. I know that couldn't have been fun. It just, it's horrible. Especially with my sweat problem. A few hours in a suit and maybe a few beers later and the first thing I'm trying to do is take the suit off. It gets tight and sweaty in there and it's just a lot of material. It's just, it's just too much. Too much. And doorways, trying to get through doorway. Ugh. Forget about it. Number four, fava beans. Well, after all that sweating and being around all that foulness, ladies needed to detox. How about a nice face mask made of beef? Yes, that's right. To keep their skin young and beautiful, they would drape a slice of beef over their face. Nothing like a little Hannibal Lecter before bedtime. Now, I hear you saying, well, Chad, that's not that bad. Okay, but think about this, though. For the time period, that beef was probably yucky due to food processing practices of the time. And, and there's just no fridges. That means it was stinky. I hope it was at least winter before these ladies decided to beef up like that. This process of beef was supposed to rejuvenate the skin because beef contains some important vitamins for such. I just, I can't recommend that. You just walk in with the beef and, hello, darling, yes. Yeah. Ugh, gross. Number three, hot Christmas. This is just so dumb. I'm just gonna go ahead and tell everyone at home right now not to do this, because I know some of you, and some of you are gonna be like, oh, thanks, Chetty, that's cool. No, don't do it. I'm a doctor, a lawyer, and a firefighter. Basically, this was a super fun game that felt like something out of Johnny Knoxville's head, not Victorian families gathering at Christmas. Basically, they would gather at Christmas to play a game called Snapdragon. You get a bowl of raisins and almonds, you pour some brandy in there, and maybe one out for your homie, and ignite the brandy. Once the bowl is on fire, the family will compete to see who can grab the flaming treats and eat them the fastest. Okay, second degree burns are not how I want to spend my holiday season, and also, in a time before smoke alarms and a modern fire service, this sounds like a really bad time. Grandpa could lose it out of his hands. Drapes catch fire, the house burns down, probably the whole neighborhood. Just a bad idea. Also, I hate raisins, so setting them on fire? Yeah, I'm out. I don't like raisins. They're gross, dude. I don't like them. Number two, crypt picks. Look, it's a part of life. It happens. You live, you love, and depending on how much your wife likes interior design, you probably have a sign hanging up like that in your home somewhere that says something like that. You know what I'm talking about. And after spending all that time in home sense, it's all over. Fade the black, cease to exist, the forever box. There's a whole process and respect in the undertaking business. The Victorian era had a strange tradition, however. How about taking photographs with the body of a family member who has recently passed on? Yeah, that's right, I know. I couldn't believe it, really. People would sit there for minutes taking photos of those who are no longer with us because the process of taking photos was not great. This isn't the digital age, after all. This is something that the Crypt Keeper would make you do. Keep, just, and, and keep them in the album or something. Just, just not, not for your everyday family, man. That's just weird. Yes, yeah, so now we're going to take photos. <laughs> like, that's just weird, you know what I mean? It's just weird, it's weird. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Listen, the women of Victorian London feared this guy, and how can you blame them? A terror that seemed to come from nowhere and could strike from anywhere. Humans unaliving other humans is nothing new, and it probably won't be old, it won't get old soon. We, we're, this is what we do, it's kind of our thing. But this was the first modern serial unaliver. Jack the Ripper's identity has never been found. It's only been speculated, and some studies suggest that it has been revealed, but it's really hard to pinpoint something that happened that long ago. He was nasty, and the crimes were awful. The photographs of the crime scene do not exactly follow today's media rules or decency, as it's really just horrible, and it's just really messy and bloody and just gross. It's kind of hard to talk about this era without Jack the Ripper. Women should feel safe at night no matter what era it is. That's right, ladies, I'm on your side. Kicking off the list at number 10, dark dining. 
I don't know about you, but I can't eat in the dark. I need to see every single bite that I'm eating, okay? Call me crazy. Part of me wants to go to a restaurant where you can't see anything, but I know that I won't make it all the way through. I can't do it. I like, I have a thing. I have to just, I'm not blindly, what if it's not cooked? I don't know. Back in the Victorian era, dining in complete darkness wasn't just a date night. It was actually the best way to digest, or so they thought. That's why many Victorian era homes had their dining rooms set up in their basement. How random is that? Oh, do you guys have poker nights down here? Nah, just brunch. Kill the light. <laughs> what? How do you like your eggs? Turn off the light. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Number nine, saved by the bell. I'm sure you've heard about this at some point, but allow me to go into grim detail. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, everything bad, you name it, it was all spreading. Not an ideal time to be alive. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill, but with this came a dark trend. The safety coffin. Yeah, we got a safety, we got the safety dance, now we got the safety coffin, here we go. These coffins, I mean, God forbid you were buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again and exit said coffin. A lot of these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground and attached to a bell on the outside. So if a passerby or heard it, one, that would be so scary, but if they heard it, they would know something's up and they would help them out. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. For example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester, he passed in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his casket, revealing a layer of glass. Now, if anybody were to see condensation, he could then be removed. Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868. It was an approved burial case, a real patent. This was a real coffin. This is crazy. This one had an air inlet, a ladder, and a bell. All three, there you go. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, he could ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save himself from premature death by being buried alive. Nice. You thought you died. Psych, climb this ladder. There you go. Good luck getting up. Now you're in an escape room. Enjoy. You only get two hints. Like a little walkie talkie. Hey, uh, how do I get out of the coffin in room B? Number eight, no air. Now that song's gonna be stuck in your head. Jordan Sparks, a classic. Since we're on the topic of safety coffins, I had to include one more. Maybe two more, I'll never tell. This one is fascinating. The science involved here was honestly impressive. There was the classic wire and bell method, but the more sick people got, the more creative they had to become. Like for example, patent number 268,693, John Krishbaum's device for indicating life in buried persons. Yeah, an 1882 classic, we love this. We got the iPod Nano, they got the device o life. Nice. Upon first glance, you may think this is some type of medieval punishment, whatever, but really this device detects movement whilst providing much needed air. Now you obviously can't have a hole in the ground or else rats will make your real demise much worse than suffocating, right? So John's device here, as per the disclosure details, is that if the person buried should come to life, a motion of his hands will turn the branches of the T-shaped pipe upon or near which his hands are placed. A marked scale on the side of the top indicates movement of the T and air will then pass come down the pipe. Once sufficient time has passed to assure the person is dead, the device can be removed. Yeah, imagine waking up with this in your hands. I wouldn't be calm enough to turn it and then breathe in a passive amount of air. No way, there's nothing passive about waking up in a coffin. Number seven, bad hair day. Okay, you want it messed up? Let's do messed up. Hope you're not eating any food right now, especially not eating in the dark. Two red flags. Okay, the Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 had readers invested on this fateful day. Right on the cover, it read, a 30-year-old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. Now at the time, that's not far off from average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case was odd. Everyone wanted to read about this. This case was noteworthy. It was important that folks understood what took this young lady's life. Doctors asked the family if they can carry out a post-mortem, and lo and behold, they found a two pound, solid chunk of hair sitting in her stomach. Two pounds. That's what happened. That's how she met her fate. That's horrible. This ball of hair caused an ulceration of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. The woman's sister did note that over the last dozen years or so, she had casually been eating her own hair. So at this time, I say, if you know anybody eating hair, send them this link. It's not a good idea. Cut that out. Stop doing that. Number six, the Great Famine. Weird time to talk about a famine after the hair incident, but okay, here we go. 
Back in 1845, a potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on was no longer available. This was huge. This is bad history right here. A group of microorganisms wiped them all out, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law at this point and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people. This famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. Historical, definitely. Messed up? Absolutely. Number five, Queen Victoria's name change. Every year on May 2-4, we set off fireworks, then we have way too many hot dogs. It's the best. We call it Victoria Day, right? It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? Well, back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony. It was small, obviously. Victoria's uncle only let a few people attend. Like I mentioned in part one, she had an isolated childhood with the whole Kensington system. That was no way to live. But even the day she was christened, trouble awaited. Her name was Alexandrina Victoria, and at the time, the name Victoria was not regal. It was a French origin, almost an odd name to have at the time, so she was immediately advised to change her name to something more traditional. But as our calendars can definitely confirm, she said, nope, I'm good. Victoria Day. Yeah, it's definitely Victoria Day. Number four, tattoos. I only have the one tattoo, but I've always wanted more. Just not so good with needles, you know? I got my eyebrow pierced and I fainted. It's a fun fact, I have a little scar there. Not great with needles. Some of the designs are so beautiful on tattoos, the amount of pain you all sit through, I'm impressed, honestly, mad respect. The tattoo craze really took off once Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, he went and visited Jerusalem. And of course he saw copious amounts of body art and was inspired. Inspired, we'll say, yeah. So upon his return, he was all about ink at this point. And the Prince of Wales, well if he has a sleeve, well then maybe I can have a sleeve, right? What's going on? It wasn't a sleeve, really. It was a cross. The prince got a tattoo of a cross in homage to the Crusades. So if you're gonna try and convince your parents to let you get a tattoo, just, you know, tell them the Prince of Wales did, right? You're just trying to be a royal. Number three, gym day. Believe it or not, there were around 200 gyms across Europe during Victorian times. Yeah, just like six good lives. So you're like, what? what's this about? Even Victorian dudes skip leg day. How great is that, okay? It's not just you. These gyms weren't bright, they weren't open, they weren't well ventilated, they weren't motivating, and definitely not safe. None of those, definitely not. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class, obviously. Grab your pocket watch and blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing squats today. These machines also were not ideal. They were designed as antiques first rather than their purpose. Also, half of these look like saw traps. Like, are you kidding me? No way I'd bend my arm around any of these devices. No way. All those wooden wheels? No. I'll stay weak and brittle. Thank you. Number two, ghost photography. How to look back. I don't like talking about ghosts. As if the reanimated corpses coming back to life while they were ringing a bell wasn't scary enough. Yeah, let's talk about 1800s ghost photography. The camera was a hot new invention at this time, so tales of ghosts and spirits were now easily believed. Yeah, obviously, when you have a photo of a see-through woman, you're like, I, that must be, that's pretty terrifying. A big name in the ghost game was a man named William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849 and Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. So far, so good. This British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a real spirit. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine a day where somebody being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize also poses for photo ops with ghosts. You're like, I don't, do we believe all of this or none of this? What's going on? This is so scary. And finally, number one, music for eternity. Before we wrap up this wild part two, I had to include perhaps one of the creepiest patents of all time. Patent numero 9,222,059. Yeah, the number is going a little bit higher. This one got me thinking. I wanted to end this video off on this note. I like this idea. Maybe, I don't know yet. Music for Eternity Systems. Okay, this patent is not from the 1800s, but rather 2015. I know, it's not Victorian, but when else am I gonna talk about this, really? The idea here is that you could stay connected to your loved one by using a solar-powered digital music player. The best part here is the patent details how surviving family members now have the ability to update, revise, and edit stored audio files and programming after burial. Yeah, next Rihanna album, no problem, I got you. There's a speaker in the casket and there's a headphone jack on the tombstone so we can listen together and then we can decide if we hate the album. That's creepy, I wouldn't do this. Would you want this? Sound off below if you'd want, you know, big shiny tunes playing for eternity after you die. I would do the Titanic theme song, just make everyone so sad all the time. Yeah.